Hey you guys, so something I've been thinking about a lot lately is before I recommend products, if it was sent to me in PR specifically, I try to think like, would I buy this with my own money? Because there's a lot of products that are really easy to recommend, but because I'm sent them for free, I'm not really making that connection as to whether or not like, was this worth my money that I work hard for? And then I got to thinking about how a lot of my most expensive products I don't really touch or use ever. So I dug out my absolute most expensive products from every kind of category. I'll let you guys know which ones I purchased myself, which ones were sent in PR. I think there was only two that were sent in PR, but anyways, and then I'll let you know whether or not I think those products are actually worth it and if they're not worth it then what I would recommend instead. Hookie dokie. That was a pretty long intro. <laughs> Let's jump into it. I'm gonna put my hair behind my ears. I'm also gonna zoom you guys in just a touch so that you can see more close up. So to start with primer I'm gonna be using this uh, Guerlain Abiel Abbe. I think somebody told me how to pronounce it. I think it was pronounced Abbe Royale which is this youth watery oil. Um, I used this on my channel a few videos ago. This was sent to me in PR. It costs $125 Canadian. So I'm just going to take a bunch of that in my hands. The truth is, I really, really, really like the feel of this, especially because I have such a dry skin. I feel like this just feels so, so nice on my skin, but I don't seem to notice it really like affecting that much how I put my makeup on. Certainly not anywhere near like $125 worth of a difference. It's also quite heavily fragranced as a lot of uh, really high-end products are, unfortunately. It doesn't really feel oily to me. It just feels like the tiniest bit tacky um, and kind of like more hydrated. A lot of the times when I touch right here specifically or right here, I can feel how dry my skin is. Um, and my skin definitely does feel a lot more hydrated after putting that on. Okay, for my foundation, the most expensive foundation I own is La Mer, which I purchased myself. This guy runs for $150 Canadian. This is very clearly not my skin color right now. So I picked out my second most expensive foundation to mix it with, which is my Tom Ford stick foundation, which is $105 Canadian. So I'm gonna mix those two together. This is going to be a $255 foundation. Oh, but this one's actually pretty light too. Should we mix in a third expensive foundation? Oh my God, that one is really light too. I have worn both of these foundations multiple times, so I'll be able to tell you like how they wear and all that kind of stuff at the end. So don't fret about the fact that I'm mixing them. I'm gonna fucking just go for it and add a third foundation. <laughs> okay, the third foundation that I'm adding is the Burberry Fresh Glow Foundation. This was one of my all time favorite foundations. It's discontinued. <laughs> I love my life. And that guy cost $62. I purchased that one with my own money as well. So I'm just mixing that in to hopefully get this a little bit darker. Sure, we're gonna try that. Okay, I have my little beauty blender and my $300 foundation. A little light still, I think. Maybe a little too yellowy. Not a perfect match, but an expensive one. Weird. I feel like it's not even adhering to that spot. So the La Mer foundation, I admittedly actually really liked when I used it. Um, the one thing I noticed is when I first applied it, it looked really quite dry on my skin, but I found that it wore beautifully throughout the day. So kind of like after an hour of me wearing it for the rest of the day, it looked beautiful, like glowy, not too matte, not too shiny. Like it was just honestly perfect. It was such a beautiful foundation. It's a hard one to recommend, but it is beautiful. It's something that kind of makes you feel special while you're putting it on. It, is very heavily scented as well. So this is kind of what we're working with, ignoring the shade match. This ended up being quite full coverage. I wasn't sharing it out with anything. Um, I feel like it's a little bit more matte than I personally like, although I wouldn't necessarily call it matte. I would probably call it more of a satin finish, if anything, because I can still see a nice kind of glow to my skin here. I feel like it covered oak. Okay okay the breakouts of mine that are a little bit more flat and less flaky this one definitely like you can see that texture is kind of emphasized at least i think so um and i do feel like already just after like literally seconds of having this on my face i can tell that it's going to settle into my smile lines right there um which is something i find that i avoid by having a more kind of a luminous foundation. Okay, for my most expensive concealer, I had the Tom Ford concealer. I purchased this with my own money as well. This used to be one of my all-time favorite concealers. I would literally purchase this every day for the rest of my life, but they reformulated it. <laughs> Truly the heartbreak of my life. <laughs> it's brutal. So $68 for this guy. I'm just gonna go ahead and pop that on and hope that this color even moderately works. 
feel like it'll be okay. I'm hoping that this foundation will oxidize a little bit and get a little darker. Man, this concealer used to be so perfect. I don't feel like it's a bad concealer now, but it just isn't what it was. And it was even just like the formula, the color, everything, because sometimes I'll find a formula that I really, really love in like concealer or foundation or whatever, but they just don't have a shade that matches me really well. It just looks a little drier than it used to. So sad. And then to set that concealer, I'm gonna use my most expensive powder, which is the Guerlain Meteorites Powder. This costs $77. I fucking like the smell of this. So funnily enough, I actually didn't purchase this, nor did I get sent it in PR, but I <laughs> made a Sephora purchase and they sent this to me accidentally and I was like, okay. I was fucking dirt poor at the time. This is very old, probably expired. <laughs> I'm gonna take this on this little powder puff they give me with it and I'm gonna pat that underneath the eyes. I don't know if that did anything just now. Okay, I'm gonna quit fucking around and take a brush. I just, I don't know about the concept of this. So it's like the little pearl balls, but I feel like I do this and it just all goes into the air. And I feel like none of it gets on my brush. And maybe like if it was a blush, it would be really nice because you just have like a little delicate frosting of Guerlain blush. But I feel like for a setting powder, this is a tough call for me, Chief. I feel like it's really hard to get enough powder to set my under eyes. And I don't really use that much powder. For my eyes, I'm gonna be using two different eyeshadow palettes because there are two brands that immediately pop into my head when I think of really sickeningly priced eyeshadows. And that is Pat McGrath. This one was sent to me in PR. And Natasha Denona. This one was purchased by me and then sent to me in PR two weeks later. So I gave the PR one to my friend. This one was purchased by me. And I haven't gotten the chance to try either of these yet. So this is the Natasha Denona Safari palette. That costs uh, $162 Canadian. Um, and then I have the Pat McGrath holiday collection, which was $70 Canadian, which was actually reasonably priced for Pat McGrath. I'm gonna use my Tom Ford concealer as a little base for my eyes instead of eye primer. I'm gonna start with my Natasha Denona $162 Safari palette. What color though? I think Lotus. Ooh, I just nunchucked my eye with a brush. We're off to a bad start. Okay, taking that color Lotus, I'm grabbing my Smith 230 brush. I'm going to bring that into my crease. Oh, that color is much lighter than I thought it would be. It's just a very gentle little pink. I'm gonna take the color, I'm, you know what, I'm not even gonna try to butcher all the names in this palette. I am white, very clearly. I don't need eyeshadows to reveal that any further. So I'm gonna grab this color. Taking that on the exact same brush, I am just bringing that basically over top of that pink because it wasn't very dark. So I'm using this more as my transition shade, but I think I'll probably take Lotus and like sweep over top. So let me just do that now. Bring that pink color back a little bit after we've deepened it with that other color. Then I'm gonna grab that kind of brighter rusty orange color. This color story is so appealing to my senses. It just really makes me feel alive. I'm gonna grab that on a Smith 235 brush, just on the tippity top of the brush, and I'm going to just lightly bring that into the crease, and then I can kind of start buffing it down onto the lid a little. So far, so good. Um, I think that this palette was kind of similar to subculture in that I love it the most, but everyone on YouTube seems to hate it. <laughs> I think a lot of people were having problems with like patchiness and stuff like that, um, especially with the kind of like more greeny, olivey tones there. And what can I say? I told you so, olive is the worst. <laughs> Been saying it for years, folks. Okay, I'm gonna take a little shading brush and I'm gonna grab this nice color right here. And I think I'm just going to, oh, beautiful. Tap that across the lid. Trying to kind of press that onto the lid rather than swiping it on because these are very matte and they're also quite pigmented so I don't want to get a lot of fallout. And then I just kind of dotted my blending brush between that brighter orange color we used and the color we just applied on the lid. And I'm just sort of buffing it over. Huh, this is kind of weird. I'm gonna take the lighter coral color that we used, and I'm going to just sort of lightly buff over this. I feel concerned. Let's just keep her going and we'll see where this ends up. It's not like it takes a long time to build that color up, 
but I feel like it takes a long time to make the application look even. I'm not sure if you guys will be able to tell, but I feel like it's quite a bit darker right here, and then it's almost like there's this kind of light patch. So it's like you really have to pay attention where you're laying that shadow down. I'm gonna take this color right here and I'm going to pat that on the outer corner just to deepen it up a little bit. I'm kind of doing it in like a moon crescent shape. And then again, we can kind of grab our blending brush and just buff over everything, make sure it looks nice and blended or as blended as we can get it. I've noticed that for my own personal mental health, I can't watch too many people's makeup tutorials or I get insecure about my blending. I'm gonna take that light pink color one more time and just kind of dust over. That did nothing. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I really like the tones of this. I feel like it got a little muddier than I was hoping it would be. Like, I feel like there's not really a separation between all those colors I applied. We just applied five colors and it kind of looks like maybe two or three. I also feel like I had a hard time not blending it so far upwards because it just was applying kind of patchy. So I felt like I had to kind of keep going over it and keep going over it with um, the same color to like build up that color so it didn't look patchy. Um, so I feel like by building up and building up and building up, we ended up kind of really like over building and now, now I look like this. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears for a min and we're gonna, we're gonna dive into the world of Pat McGrath. I'm gonna take this color right here. It looks very beautiful. Oh, let me show it on your, my, not on your finger. I'm gonna show it on my finger. It wants my head to be out of the frame. Look at it. See all the different little colors that are in that? Beautiful. Okay, well, I might as well not waste that $3 worth of product. I'm gonna pat that. That was not only a pun, but also this color is very visually pleasing. Oh my goodness. That color is really beautiful. Ooh, I feel like I like this for like a Christmas look. You know what I mean? Maybe it's a little much for Christmas with like the family, but maybe not. I'm gonna grab a Smith 256 brush and I'm gonna wet it because I wanna see how this shadow works wet and see if I can kind of amp up the intensity. I'm gonna wet it with Fix Plus. I'm a bougie motherfucker. Ooh, it even looks nice on my brush wet. Okay, I feel like I was able to get it like maybe a little bit more intense when it was wet, but definitely not anything that's like particularly notable. Oh boy, I really, really love the colors we have going on here personally. Every fiber of my being wants to keep this the same tones on the bottom because I'm loving every minute of it. But for the sake of trying more shadows from each palette, I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna grab the color Rhino right here. That one I can pronounce just fine. And I'm taking that on a Smith 230 brush and I'm going to get rid of my fallout first. Oh, there actually wasn't even that much. Wow, shocking. Okay, I'm gonna take that color Rhino and I'm going to... Oh, that one's very um gently pigmented. I'm gonna take a little bit more of a dense brush since we're not able to get as much kind of impact out of that with a blending brush. My dense brush has foundation all over it. Okay, there we go. So that one definitely you need a little bit more of a dense brush to get that kind of pigmentation. I'm gonna take the same brush and I'm gonna grab that green shade out of the Pat McGrath palette. Ooh, this is a, a like much drier shade. And I'm gonna try and, hmm. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna wet my brush. Try that color again. I had a hard time building up that kind of green color even when I was using a wet brush. So just for the sake of like showing you guys, this is when I try to build that green color up with a dry brush. This is with a wet brush, which almost turned it into like a watercolor kind of thing. It was weird. And then this is like a really heavy finger swatch. Cause you only have six colors going on here. And that's kind of one of like the main pops of color that might be kind of pushing you to purchase. Um, I just feel like that's not the intensity I was kind of looking for from that shadow. It kind of just looks like the faintest of sparkles. It really isn't showing up much at all. I'm gonna pop back to our Pat McGrath palette and I'm gonna grab this lightest shade there. I'm taking the lightest shade on a little shader brush and I'm going to bring that into our inner corner. Okay you guys, so that is the finished eye look. 
So for my most expensive bronzer, I will be using my Soleil Tan de Chanel. This guy cost me $68. I love the smell of this so much. It smells like Barbie makeup. I'm gonna take that on my beauty blender and I'm going to, oh, there's a little hair in there. I'm taking my beauty blender and I am going to apply that all over my body. I've talked about this bronzer before. I really like this bronzer some days and then other days it looks so whack. It's really bizarre because like right now this looks quite like yellowy, orangey bronze. But sometimes when I apply this for some reason, it looks green. And I think it's like a really pretty formula, but I just wish that there was more colors. Like I wish that there was a color that was less kind of like orangey um, and a little bit more kind of like cool toned or bronzy. Then for blush, I have an $85 Tom Ford blush. This is in the shade Love Lust. I picked this guy up myself. I'm gonna grab that on the most expensive brush I own, my Hakuhoto brush. I'm just gonna grab a little, little dibble dabble of it. Ooh, that is a really pretty blush, but I'm gonna zoom you guys in to show you something in a second. I don't know if you can see, but right here, I feel like that blush just kind of like made it look super textured only in this area. Like even on the other side of the face, I feel like it doesn't look really textured like that. I'm only being a nitpicky bitch because this cost $85. So <laughs> let me zoom you out. For highlight, my most expensive highlight is this Chanel highlight. It's discontinued. It's the one that had like kind of a flower pattern in it. I was trying to look up online how much this guy cost at the time that I purchased it. Um, and I found one website that said it was around $72 US, which is around $94 Canadian. So this is the Chanel Camellia de Plumes. God damn it. Oh wow. Okay, well, that's pretty special. <laughs> I don't even feel like it makes my skin look as textured as normal powder highlights do. Probably because it was $94 and it's Chanel. This is a lipstick that I purchased myself. It is the Christian Louboutin lipstick. These are <laughs> ridiculous. This cost me $123 Canadian. This is in the shade, ooh, let me grab the box. This is in the shade Rose du Desert. It came in this little packaging like this. It's really quite beautiful. It was a little bit of an experience. So I chose to pick up one of the sheer ones and then I also have one of the matte ones. This sheer one is so beautiful. All right, you guys, so this is the finished makeup. So first we started with our very fancy Guerlain primer. Um, this primer I actually really enjoy the user experience of, so to speak. I do feel like it's very um, scented. The more I use it, the more I feel like that scent kind of just like lingers and gets to me a little. Um, the first time I used it, I feel like I wasn't that kind of taken aback by it, but now I'm just like, I feel like I still smell it, but it could be the La Mer one. I love that this makes my skin feel hydrated. Um, I don't feel like it feels really oily or anything like that, and it doesn't seem to break up my foundation. But all in all, at $125, let me pull up my price list to verify that. Yeah, at $125, I personally wouldn't repurchase this, um, and I think it's cool, but not that cool. In terms of something similar that feels a little less fancy for sure, um, I would recommend the Smashbox Primerizer. I feel like this leaves my skin feeling similarly hydrated. Thank you, Alana, for the recommendation. Um, and it's a fraction of the cost. Then we moved on to our foundations. I did mix three foundations, but I'm gonna walk you through every single foundation that I used, what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it when I used it on its own. So I'm gonna be kind of reviewing them separately. So. The first foundation is the La Mer Soft Fluid Foundation. This guy costs $150. Wearing this on its own, I feel like it applies to a more kind of like matte satin finish. And the more it settles on your face throughout the day, I find that it gets a little bit dewier, um, but not something that looks like an oil slick. It just looks a little bit more like your skin. I feel like this one almost like settles into your skin and looks better the longer that you wear it. So I actually really enjoyed this foundation when I first got it. I always would apply it and it'd be like, my makeup looks like shit and then two hours later be like, oh fuck, I look awesome. <laughs> However, I feel at that steep of a price point, there's so many other foundations on the market. I just feel like that's such a hard 
price point to justify. Again, it feels fancy, it feels great, um, but I just feel like there's other foundations that definitely blow this one out of the water for me. The closest I would say in terms of the kind of look and finish to this guy is the Double Wear Nude Water Fresh Makeup from Estee Lauder. This is actually one of my favorite foundations. I feel like I prefer it over this one. This guy's a little bit more full coverage, which I tend to shy away from now. This one's more like medium to kind of sheer buildable. And I feel like it wears really similarly. It's a little bit more kind of like satin finish when you first apply and then it gets a little bit dewier throughout the day. So I definitely could uh, get rid of this La Mer one and never really miss it. Whereas the Estee Lauder one, I kind of go back to all the time. Then we had the Tom Ford foundation stick. If you guys have been following me for a while, you guys have probably seen me go back and forth with this one. My main issue with this foundation is that it breaks me out. I think it's beautiful. It looks absolutely gorgeous on the skin, albeit a little bit heavy for what I like to wear these days. But again, at $105, I feel like there has to be absolutely zero downside to that foundation for me to justify that cost. You can get a pretty similar look using the Makeup Forever HD foundation sticks. However, I feel like this one has a little bit more longevity than the Makeup Forever sticks. I definitely found myself having to powder my foundation when I was using the uh, Make It Forever stick versus this one. Um, this one just kind of wore really well, even if I wasn't powdering it. So in conclusion, when it comes to that Tom Ford foundation, I probably actually would keep wearing this and buying this if it wasn't for the fact that it breaks me out. So paying $105 for acne is really not my cup of tea. Ooh, then we had the Burberry, what was this called? Fresh Glow Foundation. This was my all time favorite foundation. Yes, I would buy this a hundred times over again and again and again. I wish so badly it wasn't discontinued. If you can find this anywhere near you and you want great foundation for a few months, fucking get it, man. If you are unable to find that foundation, I would say that the Natasha Denona Face Glow is the kind of closest foundation to it. I just think that this one is a little bit more kind of like thick almost, and this one's a little bit like thinner, more liquidy. If you're fine with that, really similar finish and wear time, I find. Then we moved on to the Tom Ford concealing pen. I have complained bitterly about this more than once, but let's just do it again. This used to be the absolute best concealer I had ever tried in my entire life, formula-wise, color-wise, it was the fucking best. I loved every second of it. They reformulated. Why in God's name did they do that? Who fucking knows? The new formula I really don't like as much. It's kind of just like a nondescript formula in my opinion. It's not something that I put on and I'm blown away by. I feel like it looks a lot less hydrating than the last one did. I find that it makes my under eyes look a lot more dry. In terms of the closest formula um, to the original Tom Ford concealing pen, I would say that is the First Aid Beauty Bendy Avocado Concealer. This one looks really nice and hydrating under the eyes it applies really beautifully it's a little bit more kind of like sheer medium coverage which is what the Tom Ford one was originally it definitely still keeps you covered if you aren't dealing with extreme um, discoloration underneath your eyes uh, I feel like it's pretty good for the like average person the shade range is dismal then we moved on to powder so I use the whoa oh god <laughs> so clumsy today I used the Guerlain meteorites powder I love the smell of it deeply, truly, I really, really do. Um, this is fucking useless. <laughs> My favorite loose powder for setting is the Hourglass Veil Translucent Powder. We tried out the Natasha Denona Safari Palette and the Pat McGrath Holiday Collection. I'm gonna start with Natasha Denona. I do feel like these shadows applied a little bit patchy um, and I kind of had to spend a lot of time kind of blending over top and just kind of like repacking on that shadow. It wasn't just a really seamless application. So it kind of, um, I would liken it to the user experience of subculture. It wasn't that extreme in my opinion, um, but I do feel like it's an eyeshadow palette that like you would want to use on the days where you have a little bit more extra time to kind of fiddle around if there's any sort of little problems that arise during application. Color story wise, I think this palette is absolutely stunning. I'm definitely going to keep it kind of like on my desk to continue using because I think it's beautiful and I really want to get use out of this guy. I felt like all the shadows showed up pretty much like what I was expecting. Rhino, I felt it kind of fell a little bit short um, and Lotus, I was surprised by how light it was. I think because I love so many colors in this palette personally, I would repurchase this if in any fucking world I was gonna run through these shadows. Like I don't regret this purchase, so to speak. I don't feel like it was the most mind blowing formula ever, but I do feel like you get quite a few colors and I really, really do like that color story. And I feel like a lot of these colors just strike me as kind of more unique. Then we moved on to the Pat McGrath palette. This is, <laughs> 
the smallest, tiniest gripe of all time. But one thing that really annoyed me about this is that the palette doesn't stay open. So when I'm doing my eyeshadow and I'm having to kind of dip back in to the color over and over, it just kept closing and closing. I know it's like the smallest thing ever, but it's just something where they clearly put time and money and effort into this packaging. Um, it's like a, a custom package. It's not something that they just picked up from a shelf and said, pop our eyeshadows into that. They made this packaging. Um, that's clear to see and it's beautiful, but I just think it's just, it's just one of those small things that when you're spending so much money, you want it to be, I want it to be a really good user experience from start to finish. Like the packaging's beautiful, it's functional, it works, it makes sense. The eyeshadow formula is beautiful, the color combinations are beautiful, just everything, you know? And I feel like that's just something that, I don't know. Anyways, whatever, nobody gives a shit. So, so I was really impressed with this red tone. I thought it went just beautifully over top. I did find myself wishing that I could make it a little bit more intense, kind of like with a wet brush or whatever. I just wanted almost a little bit more texture out of it, but the dual chrome effect is really, really beautiful. And I think it looks really unique. The green shade fell really short for me, unfortunately. Um, and I think that that is something that would possibly be a big pull for people to this palette. Like you probably wouldn't be buying for like the warm neutral shades. It would probably be sooner because of that sort of red olivey shift or that green. And the green just didn't perform how I would want it to. Um, if I had purchased this palette myself, I think I'd be pretty disappointed in that formula. And then we used that little shimmery kind of champagne shade in the inner corner, which looks fine. I think personally, I wouldn't have purchased this Pat McGrath palette, but I just wanna say something about both Natasha Denona and Pat McGrath real quick. I think the thing that I struggle with personally is that I feel like both of these brands are coming out with really unique shadows. They're coming out with kind of different textures and really different colors and stuff like that and different color combinations. And it really draws me into their products because it just looks so different. Like it's not the same neutral eyeshadow palette released over and over and over again. The only thing I struggle with with both of these brands, but more so Natasha Denona these days because Pat McGrath is releasing smaller palettes, is that they typically release palettes that are quite large and therefore quite expensive. And I am oftentimes just drawn to like a few colors. The reason I picked up the Safari palette was because I actually felt like I was drawn to like most of the colors, but with a lot of the Pat McGrath palettes, and I've purchased quite a few myself, I purchased the three big ones that she came out with initially that were in that black packaging. I felt like there was a couple shades in each palette that I really loved, but then there was a ton of shades that I didn't really like or the formula fell flat for me. I'm so drawn in because of a few beautiful, unique colors, but the rest of the palette, I just don't end up getting that much use out of, especially with Pat McGrath. I feel like her um, eyeshadow palettes, the color stories are often pretty all over the place for me. They're a lot more editorial, which is really beautiful for like runway looks and stuff like that. But for someone who's wearing my makeup just kind of day to day, I want something that I can just kind of put together really easily and not have it look like high fashion. So I don't feel like her eyeshadows are worth the money as much because there's nothing about the formula that I'm usually that impressed by. Um, there's a few colors that I feel like are unique, but I would sooner buy them as like a single shadow if I could. With Natasha Denona, I haven't really been upset with her formula so far, but again, I just feel like it comes down to if you really, really love most of the colors in one of her palettes because they're so big, then I feel like yes, it's worth the money because they are oftentimes more unique than what's currently on the market, especially kind of like all put together. Um, but if there's only a few shades that you're being drawn to, I would recommend trying to find a dupe because it's just so over the top expensive and it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel completely worth it to me unless you feel like you're gonna get use out of almost all of the palette. The Chanel Tan de Soleil. Chanel Soleil Tan de Chanel. I'm so sorry. I feel like I love the formula of this, but because you are so limited with only being able to buy that one color, I, I just feel like this product is not worth the cost. I would absolutely feel like it was worth the cost if they had more of a shade range. There's gonna be people that works great for it and there's gonna be people that are like, no, that doesn't work and that's your only option. So in that, love the formula, but because of that color, I, I just know I wouldn't repurchase this personally. In terms of something similar, I would recommend the Nude Sticks Bondi Bay. They are really similar in tone when they're blended out. Nude Sticks Bondi Bay is a little bit more kind of red toned, um, but I'm just gonna apply that and blend it out and then apply 
this Chanel one side by side. So the Chanel one is a little bit more yellowy toned in my opinion, and the Nude Sticks Bondi Bay is a little bit more kind of like red toned. The formula is really beautiful on both. I absolutely love this formula and I hope that they come up with more shades that are a little bit more kind of like bronzy cool toned. It's a quarter of the price and if the Chanel one works for you but you don't wanna keep spending that money, um, I feel like you'd probably like Nude Sticks Bondi Bay just as much. Then we moved on to the Tom Ford blush in the color Love Lust. I did feel like that color was beautiful and I really loved that it had a nice kind of sheen of gold to it. I thought it looked really nice and like luminous on my cheeks. Although I did find the formula a little bit powdery, it kind of seemed like it sat on top of my skin rather than really melting in and looking kind of like part of my, you know, face. So I did think it was really beautiful, but I, Again, feel like there's other products that I enjoy more that are at a lesser price point, which is the uh, Becca blush in the color Damselfly. They look a little different in the pan, and this one has a little bit less of a sheen to it, a little bit less of that gold, but I feel like this formula really just like melts into the skin. It looks a lot more kind of skin-like than the Tom Ford one does. I never find that this one is like looking powdery on top of my skin, so I would sooner recommend Becca over top of Tom Ford. Then we had our Chanel highlight. I actually think this is beautiful and I would purchase this again. I love this formula. I feel like it looks really nice on my skin and I'm not a powder highlight type of bitch. It is definitely really expensive, but I feel like I, I love the packaging. It feels like classy and cool. I love the kind of imprint and the highlight. So for me, it's just little things like that that do kind of justify the cost and make it feel a little bit different from a more like mid-range kind of makeup. If you are looking for a, another powder highlight that is similar in kind of texture and finish, I would say the Becca highlighters are one of the best powder highlight formulas on the market. They are a little bit more intense than that Chanel one is. I feel like this one isn't quite as like blinding, um, but they're beautiful as well. Then we moved on to the Louboutin lipstick. Uh, <laughs> I actually fucking really like this lipstick a lot. I do feel like this was worth it in my opinion, again, just because of the whole experience. I think that the box is really beautiful and cool. Like this is something that I would get for a friend for Christmas. It's just sort of like a special, occasion lipstick. Obviously I'm not going to purchase these as frequently as I would like a MAC lipstick or whatever, but if you are wanting to treat yourself, I think the formula is absolutely beautiful. They have a ton of really nice colors and the packaging is beautiful and it's so heavy. It's fatiguing to my wrist and it's just Again, little things like that that make it feel really, really special and really unique. I fucking love this color. I think it's one of the most beautiful lipsticks. Every time I put it on, I'm like, why did I ever take it off? If you can't afford $123 or you're not that ridiculous, the closest dupe I've found is Urban Decay's ex-girlfriend. They're not exact, but they are pretty similar on the lips. Uh, the Louboutin one is a little bit more plummy and the Urban Decay one is a little bit more kind of like, rosy toned, but they both are really beautiful and sheer and they just look nice and like plump on your lips. So you guys, that is everything for me today. Let me know if you guys have purchased any super high-end makeup that you've regretted or alternatively that you don't regret and you think I should buy, just throwing it out there. All right, you guys, I'll see you next time. Peace out.